from the next generation star. So here, the theory here is there is observed uh, low mass and extremely metal clusters are the, the actually the second generation stars enriched by <coughs> the first generation of supernovae. Okay. So this is a very nice success of our calculations together with the most recent observation. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, in, in a previous slide, uh, yes. you have a yes. shared color, right? Uh, I guess um, somehow your mass appreciation rate depends on the angular momentum of the oh, star wow. and also how you uh, model the turbulence uh, to, to, to help appreciate. Good, very good point. Actually, uh, the, 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 the degree of turbulence is actually included directly in our hydro simulation. But only angular momentum transport through this disk must be modeled. Uh -huh. So uh, we, we typically assume a common value for this so-called alpha parameter. So yeah. when there's a disk, at a, a certain rate, this angular momentum is transferred. And actually, whether or not this choice of alpha, which I tell you is about 0 0.6 alpha, whether or not this choice is correct can be verified in the further three-dimensional calculations. But here we just uh, assume one alpha parameter and then vary that to see the difference. For example, if we change this uh, uh, angular momentum efficiency a little bit, then this mass scale shifts around, but not significantly. This doesn't become like one solar mass. This doesn't become enormous. Amount. And the reason is stopped. 40 solar masses yeah. because uh, the entire disk entire erupts? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So uh, this, uh, let me, I think it's a good time to, uh, it's, not, it's not very easy to see. This is only the beginning. The things actually happen throughout the very end. So uh, this space, the gas is almost freely, can be upgraded. And there's a tiny, tiny disk-like structure. Eventually, uh, the, the first thing to happen is this uh, expansion of this region. You still see some more disk. Okay. But eventually, it's, it's uh, both evaporated and also uh, like pushed back by thermal pressure. By this process. Okay. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Any more questions? Do you only have one star? Yes, uh, the very center, yes. And uh, uh, next slide I am showing you. So different, obviously this is only one example. And I don't believe all the stars in the universe form in this way. So. We further explore how things change depending, depending on the places or regions or in other samples. Okay. So we now have, uh, uh, with the students, Shingo Hirano, we performed hundreds of these calculations starting from a, a large cosmological volume, and do the same calculation to get the final masses. The final answers are already indicated in this way. So although we thought, and even here I sounded as if this is like a very a simple and commonly applicable story, but the actual outcome varies a lot depending on the gas cloud. And the main reason is actually, as you asked, you know, the gas uh, angular momentum content makes this uh, difference. For example, this this case is a spiral. In other in other cases, we find uh, two or three clumps forming together in this gas chassis. So the purpose of our work here is by exploring this number of samples. We can see uh, uh, the sort of cosmic variances. I just want to show this slide because I want to show the, the, the typical effort, enormous effort of a student. Okay, so this student made this plot, although you know, partly from uh, from your side, it looks like re really the same. But if you look closely, there are actually a variety of shapes and structure and so on. And all of these things can really affect the final masses of these stellar systems. Okay, then a more uh, easy result. This is the number of stars as a function of their masses. So previously, I thought you know, 40 solar masses around here is sort of typical. It is true, but it has a width or a, a variation depending on the system. So overall, our conclusion is the characteristic mass is about like tens of solar masses, but there are certainly 
stars with smaller masses or even larger masses. And very interestingly, these very massive stars beyond 300 solar masses, they can actually eventually collapse to become a black hole, which I talk uh, later. And even a very extreme case, stars like beyond 1,000 solar mass can be formed in this way. And these narrow range of mass, tens of solar masses, they can explode as uh, uh, supernovae generating, the, uh, synthesizing and generating the heavy elements inside them. So they serve as the sources of the first heavy elements, whereas <coughs> this might become the seed for the supermassive black holes I explained in the very beginning of my talk. All right, are there different counterparts? I'm sorry? Are there different counterparts? Yeah, these are, uh, we found these, the overall evolution can be characterized by uh, typically the three evolutional uh, differences like this. So if we plot, uh, the the uh, stellar growth uh, in this plot, uh, the, the stellar radius as a function of, uh, as in units of solar radius and in the stellar mass, the the ordinary stars uh, evolve like this. After the, the contraction phase, it lands on the main sequence. But for some stars with higher gas mass accretion rate like this, then it goes uh, to a completely different evolutionary path. And these uh, different evolutionary paths, different radius, different effective temperature, they cause uh, the uh, feedback effect in a variety of strengths. And then final answer will be different for these uh, red and blue and black portion. That is just uh, the overall gas mass accretion rate changes the qualitative behavior of these protostars. Now, um, I should emphasize, this is, uh, say, at most a theoretical prediction, or in reality, it's nothing but a theory. Okay. We haven't seen any of these stars. So there must be uh, some feasible observational uh, method to prove or disprove this kind of a theoretical prediction. Here, I'd like to present one such uh, possibility but that is uh, namely the detecting the first supernova explosion, one can get an insight of relative uh, distribution of the mass scales like this. So I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so to how we prove or disprove this theoretical prediction. Okay? So uh, uh, not only gamma ray bursts or black holes, we can also see or observe a very distant supernova explosion. The one nice example is this, uh, this one, discovered by Jeff Cookie a few years ago. The supernova, this uh, black portion is a bright spot. The supernova is located at 11 billion light years away. Okay. You see the brightness variation of this object. So the, this variation lasts over like 30 uh, days or so. So in, in one part of the sky, the supernova appears suddenly and becomes bright and becomes dim. Uh, dim. There was also a spectrum in the archival data characterizing the, the, uh, the, the emission lines from various elements from this region. So this can be used to determine the, the, the relative distance to this uh, bright supernova. Okay? And this uh, type of supernova is very peculiar in that first, it is very bright. It is brighter than a billion times that of the sun. Okay. We, in astronomy, we use, say, called type 1a supernova because they are bright and can be used for cosmological distant indicator. But this kind of, of supernova, supernova can become even 100 times brighter than the, this typical example is like this. Um, theoretically, it is believed this kind of supernova becomes bright because it is powered by shock interaction. The shock wave propagates in the interstellar medium. Okay, so it has a high effective temperature. So indeed, these kind of supernovae are bright in ultraviolet if we observe it in, in the local universe. Okay? And because we need a very large energy, explosion energy, the, the possible progenitors are very massive stars with mass exceeding 50 solar mass or so. So because of this brightness in this ultraviolet and the, this overall luminosity, we can actually uh, observe this kind of uh, supernovae at a very distant region, just like this. Okay? 
this is the uh, characteristic uh, SED, the energy distribution. The, if we fit by the effective black body, the effective temperature is like 12,000 Kelvin or so. so. This is really like a bright blue object in the sky. Okay. So because of this nice spectral feature, we can observe uh, in, you know, if we put this object at a very distant region, then they become bright in infrared because the wavelengths are stretched due to the cosmic expansion. So even if it, the, the supernovae are located it, at the very uh, beginning of the universe, just like uh, 100 million years after the Big Bang, we can still see in infrared this kind of supernova. So this is a very nice feature of this. Okay? So with my colleagues, uh, Masami Tanaka and the student Takashi Moriya, we performed a very expensive Monte Carlo simulations to explore how we can find this kind of bright supernovae in the distant universe. Okay. So for this, we uh, adapt the observation of the estimated star formation rate and calibrate it to, the, to get the uh, relative supernovae rate and characteristic evolution of the uh, spectral energy distribution. And then we generate more light curves, what, how bright it becomes in certain wavelengths and so on. And then run this kind of simulation many times and get uh, this number. So uh, in, in, in Hawaii, we have in Jap uh, the Japanese telescope, Subaru, which now has a very wide area camera, new camera called Hypash Cam. If we survey only uh, 3.5 square degree, uh, only a part of the sky, and uh, the monitor it over uh, one year or so, then we can detect such very luminous supernovae. Okay, maybe the number is not very large, but maybe six or eight supernovae, and up to relative to five when the universe, the age of the universe is just about one billion years or so. Okay. We also uh, calculated the detailed evolution of how such a supernova looks like in this color space. Are they um, uh, bluer or are they uh, redder or so? And so that we can distinguish them from other astronomical sources. Okay. So of course, not only making the theoretical prediction, we are actually working hard to get really this uh, monitor uh, survey observation is performed. Okay, so uh, to, to prove, uh, we, we'd like to prove only the massive end of the stellar mass distribution. Okay. So for the, the nice thing is because these luminous supernovae, are, they have the progenitor mass at the very massive end, like 50 solar mass or so. It is very sensitive to the slope of the exact uh, stellar mass distribution. So even the number count, of such supernovae uh, detected by a uh, given observation can actually tell us how steep or how rare of such massive stars in the early epoch of the universe. So in the local universe, we, we know that stellar mass distribution is described by a simple power law called the Sulpeter mass function. In that case, we expect if this uh, stellar mass function is universal across cosmic time, then we expect we detect only 50 or so of such supernovae for a given survey. But if this number goes up, we need to consider uh, uh, a more massive stars generated. And just a, a factor of three difference or so can really tell us about how the mode of the star formation in the, the early universe was shaped in this way. Okay? This is using the ground-based telescope. In the very future, if we have a near infrared all sky surveys, this is one example for the WISH satellite uh, 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 proposed by a Japanese uh, group of astronomers. If we use that infrared satellite, then we can detect such supernovae, like hundreds or so, at Redshift 5 or so. Ultimately, we can go beyond Redshift 10, the final frontier of this, the dark ages, and we can detect one or two such supernovae in the uh, by using this infrared uh, space telescope. Okay, oh, so this is uh, one of my personal goals. This uh, plot shows the current record of this redshift. This is the distant uh, indicator, so this is more distant regions. So people so far discovered very distant uh, black holes and galaxies and gamma ray bands, <coughs> like I explained in the very beginning. But eventually, uh, right now, supernovae uh, behind uh, these three objects, but eventually my, my hope or my dream is to extend this 
to up to let's pretend also to really into the dark ages of the universe before perhaps my retirement of 2030. So. Okay. Now, uh, okay, uh, I'm in a good state. So uh, next uh, 10 minutes, I'd like to uh, give one possibility of how a very massive black hole is uh, formed in the early uh, universe. Okay. So this is an observational fact. So by a variety of observations, we can get the estimate, the, the mass estimate for the distant black holes. So this is, you know, time goes in this way, so a big man, and one giga year after, and two giga years after. Okay. The curiosity, uh, the observed bright quasars in the center of black holes, they have actually a similar masses, like you know, just about one million solar masses or so, regardless of, despite the evolution took like 13 giga years or so. Okay. So one speculation would be something like this. Somehow black holes grew very rapidly to become one billion solar masses or so. Physically it's called maybe Eddington or super Eddington accretion rate. But afterwards maybe the, uh, somehow the black hole uh, grows stops or ceases and then uh, makes this mild evolution. Even the most massive ones are just about 10 times larger than the, the youngest black holes we observe today. So this is a very curious fact. And for now, many people are interested in and concerned on how this, uh, particularly this one, uh, was formed and grew in such a short time period in the early universe. There are a few uh, proposed uh, possibilities or cases. One is obviously the remnant of the first generation stars. They leave uh, massive black holes, maybe 100 solar mass black holes. And then at some point, this black hole uh, might have grown over uh, 10 to the 8 times to become a supermassive black hole. The other scenario uh, postulates that maybe there is a way to generate or form uh, intermediate mass black holes with, say, 1 million solar mass or so. And then that helps to explain the, the early evolution of the supermassive black hole that I now explain in this simple picture. So what we observe, uh, so we have observed so far is this very massive black hole of mass one billion solar masses at the epoch when the age of the universe was 0 0.8 giga years. So. so we want to develop a theory that explains this rapid growth <coughs> from a solar mass black hole or somewhat uh, intermediate case when we, if we can form 10 to the 5 solar mass black hole in the, in the process of a direct collapse, then it helps for this uh, short time evolution. Okay. I, I now would like to explain this uh, possibility in more detail. Okay. So this is a recent uh, numerical simulation of such scenario. So if there is a massive gas cloud of 1 million solar mass, then it can eventually form a supermassive star with this mass range. And these massive stars are gravitationally unstable. So uh, very rapidly, they can actually collapse. The entire gas cloud can collapse to become a single black hole. And these authors actually prove, yes, it, the, the gas cloud has actually a rather high growth rate, like one solar mass per year. So this is like one million solar mass per million years. Okay? Because uh, if there is a strong radiation, the gas temperature is kept high, and then the accretion rate is actually kept very high. So, so far they prove there is a gas uh, cloud, and they say if this uh, gas accretion continues, then we can form this very massive star. This is uh, the, a group in the Netherlands. Now it is in our uh, our turn to really prove how such things can happen in more realistic situations. So basically, we do the same exercise as the uh, protostellar evolution, as I explained in the beginning uh, part of my talk, but now employ it for a very high gas mass accretion rate, like this. Okay? So this is the evolution of the stellar radius and the stellar mass. Simply, it, it just continues accreting the gas and itself becomes bigger and bigger. Like, you know, the, the, the radius becomes uh, 10,000 uh, uh, 10, solar radius or so. So because this object is very big, it's 
effective temperature is low, even lower than, the, uh, or as, as low as the sun, about like 7,000 Kelvin or so. So it doesn't really emit energetic ultraviolet photons. So because of this effective low temperature, the, the gas accretion just continues until the really stars uh, becomes unstable gravitationally. Okay? This is the evolution of such a case in this HR diagram. This is the effective temperature, and this is the stellar luminosity. So the evolution looks really like this. The effective temperature is locked at around 7,000 Kelvin or so. This is determined by the physical processes of H minus ions. And simply, the star becomes bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter, and finally becomes uh, more brighter than one billion times that of the sun. Okay, so this single star itself could be brighter than a single small galaxy. Interestingly, if uh, if the next generation space telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, is launched, we can actually observe such a, a very big, bright, in a low temperature object like this. So the, the SED looks like simply like a, even like a big uh, brown dwarf or so, a very low temperature black hole. So if we could spend 10 hours of the success of Hubble Space Telescope, then we can actually observe this object uh, with mass, say, uh, 100,000 solar, solar mass or 30 times 1,000 solar masses or so. OK. And as this kind of star grows, it cannot really become um, uh, eternally large because inside the core, the gravity becomes stronger and stronger. And ultimately, uh, nothing really prevents uh, the gravitational pull. So this is called a general relativistic instability. So this is stellar radius and the stellar mass. When the stellar mass reaches 10,000, 100,000 solar masses, then it almost becomes uh, very unstable to gravitational flux. Afterwards, we pretty much expect, expect this entire star will collapse to form a black hole uh, or with mass, uh, 100 solar mass, uh, sorry, 100,000 solar masses or so. So we could nicely propose the, the origin of supermassive black holes, like maybe the stellar mass seed or direct flux remnant. But the remaining mystery is how these even smaller systems can jump over this gap uh, of about uh, four orders of magnitude to become black holes. There are some speculations like a black hole, black hole mergers, or this one uh, accretes even uh, more gas efficiently and so on. But probably future observations will help us to understand how this small black hole seeds grew in time to become observed supermassive black hole. So this is, you know, so far I have been explaining the nice computer simulation that somehow reproduces some aspect of observations, but there are still remains a very large mystery or gap to uh, understand this the formation of very massive black hole. Okay, um, to summarize, so starting from a very simple state of the early universe, I explained how the first generation of stars were formed you know, out of pure hydrogen and helium gas. Okay. That, that was largely dependent on the computer simulations of uh, uh, very large scale. I also explained not only the theoretical predictions, we have a way to explore and maybe prove or disprove the theory of uh, massive star formation in the early universe by detecting very bright supernova explosions. And finally, I gave you the, both the mystery of some partial understanding of how a very massive, supermassive black hole could have been seeded by either stellar mass black hole or intermediate mass black hole. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions?
Yes. on the formation of supermassive black holes from supermassive stars. Mm. How about the supernova? Oh, oh, good question. Um, there, are, uh, there, were, there, there has been a recent paper saying, um, oh, because you know, even above uh, 10 to the 5 solar mass, uh, the interior star, the thermonuclear burning can happen. So once it becomes gravitationally unstable, the rapid nuclear burning occurs. Just like in ordinary supernovae, and then the, uh, the, the release energy might be larger than the binding energy. And uh, that particular paper or work shows when the solar mass is like five times ten to the five solar masses, then it actually explodes. But in other cases, in all the other cases, it simply collapses gravitation. It's simply a competition between the binding energy and uh, Extracted explosion. And I think the detailed evolution of these very massive stars need to be actually uh, further uh, explored. So how about potential observation? Ooh, good question. It becomes <laughs> right, I think, but uh, um, for um, realistic observation, we need actually uh, ultraviolet bright supernovae because you know, the wavelengths are stretched anyway. So uh, these very much stars might be trigger uh, energetic supernovae, but uh, we don't know yet if this becomes right in the right wavelengths. Uh, certainly <coughs> wrong. Does this provide any insight on supermassive black holes within most galaxies? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. Well, so far, we suppose these will be only seas of black holes, but as you know, they, they're uh, Everywhere in the you know, virtually all the, the center of the all the galaxies they contain supermassive black holes, and uh, I think actually the, the accretion process in such a uh, center of black hole is probably different from what I described. I only provided uh, the, the, the origin or seas for such supermassive black holes. <coughs> okay, I have some questions on the. Star yeah, simulation. Mm. First is that uh, you showed the star formation of the massive star. Mm. Is that formation consistent with the Peter function? No, it's not, it's not at all. Not at all? Not at all. That's why we need a observational test. Mm. So the, the overall result looks like this. It doesn't look, look like even power. Also, this is not really the, the uh, IMF, so to speak, because mm. uh, you know, uh, this is taken from uh, some region the box, so this is not statistically one can you can look at this with the statistical level. But that means no star home mass with uh, less than ten solar mass. Mm. In our case, in our case, it's it's just by definition we all, all uh, only follow the central stars. We, we only follow the evolution of central star. The smaller mass system by definition we can't trace, but observationally. You know, as you know, we haven't discovered pure population three low mass stars. So certainly, we don't really want to produce many of such things in the other universe. How about the initial star formation rate? Star formation rate, um, that is 